with that, um, I would like to uh, introduce our keynote speaker today. We're really honored to have Michael Clark uh, to give uh, our first keynote speech uh, of the conference. So Michael Clark is an AMD Corporate Fellow and is the Chief Architect for X86 course. Um, he uh, started work on the K5 processor AMD right after his graduation, and he served as the chip architect of the Zen Core and has contributed to every x86 processor from K5 to the latest Zen generation. As a co-architect of the AMD 64 ISA, as well as the AMD V virtualization station, he has a lot of patents, uh, tons of uh, these on uh, other technologies. He also received a master's degree in computer engineering from University of Texas in 2003 and while working at the AMD. So with that, I'm gonna uh, uh, pass over the stage to Michael. Um, let's welcome Michael for his speech. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm honored to be here as well. We, uh, everything up. Assume everyone can see that. So, uh, you know, the world has an extremely high desire for high performance computing. And, you know, this talk is going to go through uh, some of the background of that, um, the factors that go into building a good core architecture. And then we're going to deep dive into our current uh, uh, Zen 3 processor. So you can see all the elements that go into a high performance core. This is a cautionary statement. So, uh, to walk you through our current uh, roadmap, you know, we started in 2017 with our Zen, of course, you know, my favorite since I was the lead architect of that one. Uh, currently, now I, I run the core roadmap, so don't get to be a lead architect anymore. but one of the funnest jobs, uh, at least from my perspective. <laughs> um, but there we had a, a we were able to hit 4.53 gigahertz. Uh, we brought an amazing 52% IPC from our previous uh, generation core, and we built it around a four-core complex that was sharing uh, eight meg L3 uh, within the com within that complex. And, and again, we'll deep dive some of these terms uh, as we get further in the talk. Uh, supported, uh, you know, symmetric multi-threading with two threads on a core, uh, a lot of new boost algorithms to be able to uh, uh, reach higher frequencies and lower thread count workloads. That was built on a 14 nanometer process and then the Zen Plus we uh, leveraged 12 nanometer. But when you're doing a new core, um, you know, there's a, uh, along the way, there's a lot of things you realize you could have uh, done better. Uh, so we like to do a grounds up core and then follow it with what we call a derivative, uh, but a really meaty derivative, really improving all parts of, of the design. So Zen 2 was uh, the derivative of Zen. Uh, we pushed the frequency up to 4.7 gigahertz. Uh, again, it, it shared the same four core complex, uh, but now we up the L3 that was shared across those four cores uh, to 16 meg. And there we really introduced the chiplet design where uh, we took the uh, what we call the data fabric, the I/O, uh, and we uh, put it on a separate die, uh, leaving it in the older technology, and migrated the cores to the latest technology. That, that typically the you know the I/O uh, does not scale very well through the technology, so this allowed us to focus, uh, you know, all our important transistors on the core where it scales, and we can really utilize those transistors with full capability and be able to bring a lot more uh, you know, cores into the same uh, uh, package and, and uh, socket. And so uh, also our original Zen uh, had 128-bit floating point data path, uh, even though it supported uh, instructions that had 256-bit vectors with uh, Zen 2, we built the data path out to the full vector width of the ISA. Uh, and it, you know, leverage that seven nanometer transition and all those extra transistors to really deliver uh, that 15% uh, IPC boost. And then with uh, Zen 3, um, that was a grounds up design. Again, you know, 
And once we do a, a big grounds up design, like I said, there, there's a lot of uh, what we call low hanging fruit. Uh, but then we, we realized, you know, we really have to go back uh, to the drawing board and really relook at every part of the architecture to really be able to add uh, all the IPC, leverage all the transistors well, and, and not just add power to design. And as we'll see, the powers, power is equal to performance, and, and we need to redo the whole design uh, to be able to provide uh, the compute necessary. So as N3, we were able to get up to 4.9 gigahertz. Um, Again, we added 19% IPC over Zen 2. This time we, we went with an eight core complex as we were uh, wanting to integrate uh, you know, more cores within that, that, that shared cache uh, for workloads that do more data sharing. Uh, we upped the L3 to 32 meg, but it was still that four meg per core ratio. Uh, we also added uh, uh, AMD 3D vCache, which we'll talk about uh, later in the talk. Uh, for inference workloads, we doubled the, the amount of integer eight throughput in the machine. I mean, this was still on, on uh, the seven nanometer technology. And so here at AMD, our focus is on you know, high performance computing solutions, which spans a wide, wide range of products. You know, we have our Epic server CPUs, we have our Instinct accelerators, we have our Ryzen desktops, uh, we, have our Ryzen mobile that are in our laptops we're using today. We, we provide uh, you know, high performance into console gaming, uh, AMD Radeon discrete GPUs and uh, you know, CPUs into workstations. So while our cores and CPUs don't go into uh, all these products, they go into the majority as you can see. And um, you, can, you can see that there's a, a wide range of products. So that's part of the challenge um, of being an architect and that they all want high performance compute. We don't want to build a fully unique uh, core for all of these. So trying to balance off uh, all the properties of these different uh, products with, uh, with, with the minimum of change uh, within a core. Uh, so as an architect, uh, you know, there are basically five tenants of core performance. Uh, on the left is kind of well focus first. You know, I, I call it, uh, you see the circle in the middle of the wheel of performance. All these properties, you know, trade off against each other. And so as an architect, you have to try to balance uh, what you're building and what markets you're targeting uh, to get the right balance in the architecture to provide, you know, the, uh, an optimal solution. For instance, you know, IPC or instructions per clock as you try to get more instructions done per cycle, of course, that's more gates in the path that pushes on uh, your frequency capability. Also can add a lot of power. You know, power, you know, obviously uh, the environment you're in, the power budget you have uh, for the core is very important and obviously very different from, you know, being in a notebook versus being in a standalone desktop, being in a, uh, in a server environment, all have different power constraints. So you're wanting to build a core that has good energy per operation. Uh, again, on frequency, you know, some, in a lot of places, low thread count workloads, you wanna be able to hit the max frequency you can to deliver the performance to that uh, workload, uh, but also effective frequency matters. You know, we're gonna to wanna to put down, you know, a bunch of these cores so you get a lot of throughput. And so we wanna be able to get the highest frequency can within that core uh, when we're, um, you know, power constrained. And so, and then of course area, as we want to, you know, if, as we push some of these other parameters, the core gets bigger. That means we can put less cores in, in a given footprint into a different, into, uh, you know, a product, uh, as well as that drives the cost up. So we have to, you know, balance all these properties uh, as they trade off against each other, trying to build a good balanced high performance core that we can deliver into each of these markets. And then on top of that, um, we obviously have the ISA brings uh, performance as well. Uh, you know, we have to tailor for the particular ISA we're targeting, and always, um, you know, security is of utmost importance. Uh, providing performance uh, without security is is you know not uh, not 
really uh, the right solution, obviously, in today's world. Uh, we have to be able to deliver it. And then a trade off. The security typically does have some performance costs. So it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, avenue in the architectural world to still be able to provide good performance while pushing forward continuously on better security. Uh, looking historically at what you know the challenges as well are for your core architect. So this is um, you know spec in rate total throughput, um, uh, and you know this is all public. You can go you know uh, do your own version of it. This is basically looking at two socket server just because that's sort of the meat of the market over time, kind of taking the best uh, score uh, from both our competition and us, and then looking at it and you know it's. Spec in is a workload. It's not, you know, it's not the only workload out there. Uh, it does have the property of having this nice long history uh, to be able to evaluate and, and look at the trends in the industry. So as you can see, uh, you know, we've been moving up. We had, you know, uh, from 2014, uh, we were kind of falling behind. 2017, there you can see with the Zen architecture, uh, we came back to being competitive. And then in 2019, that was our that big jump. There was our um, our Zen 2, and really uh, both the performance delivered within that Zen 2 core, but also that chiplet strategy of being able to decouple uh, the cores from the the data fabric and I/O, and really being able to deliver a lot more cores into the same uh, you know footprint and package effectively. So we were able to bring a huge, uh, you know, throughput lift up into uh, into the market. Although I mean, still, you know, this is a, a linear graph. Over time, you know, this is a 37 percent uh, compound annual growth rate. So the world expects this uh, to continue, and we we are, you know, challenged to continue to keep up on that rapid pace of continually improving performance and. Uh, one other thing, of all those properties in the in the circle of um, uh, you know the, the circle of performance are all here. As as you're going along this curve, cores are going up, power budgets are going up as better cooling solutions come on, um, software, uh, you know, better compilers are coming on to be able to leverage this. So this is just like total performance, and you can see the combination of all those properties in the wheel of performance. Uh, being put to bear to, to make this incredible 37% uh, CAGR uh, for the industry. However, there are some uh, limits. People ask me a lot why we um, you know, didn't put in even more cores. Uh, and so there is uh, you know, this tension between you know, how many cores we can put in both physically and, and, and to provide good uh, performance, you know, as uh, historically, if we have those same data points of performance, this is a view of taking those, the SOCs, those cores we're in, and how much, uh, you know, bandwidth per core uh, was in each one of those. And you can see it's a pretty, pretty, you know, tight range, even historically, um, where, you know, we have to have balance within the system to be able to feed the core. So it typically sits in that uh, three to six gigabytes a second range um, of which uh, kind of constrains us in our physical ability to be able to deliver more bandwidth to the core versus the number of cores and throughput we uh, can deliver from the core perspective. All right, so that will segue into uh, security and our, our Zen 3 design or our, our journey in security as well. Uh, we started in the original uh, Zen with our uh, secure encrypted virtualization, where each virtual machine has its own unique key, as well as the hypervisor. And so none of uh, the memory can be, uh, you know, is visible to any, between the virtual machines, as well as the hypervisor himself cannot uh, inspect the memory of the virtual machines. Uh, with the, next, we added uh, what we call encrypted state, where you know, as we world switch in and out, the uh, typically the state of the machine ends up in memory. With this technology, the actual that state is encrypted, 
as it's put in memory and therefore the hypervisor can no longer see any of the state uh, of the VM and therefore a, a malicious hypervisor could not manipulate that state in a way that would uh, violate uh, the security of uh, the VM. And then with Zen3, uh, we come along with secure nested paging, which provides even more protection against malicious hypervisors by locking down uh, the page tables such that uh, you know, a hypervisor can't remap the physical memory pages underneath the guest. And while I can't inspect them, it could make it operate on the wrong data uh, before this technology now. The uh, VM knows it has, uh, it's using the data that it's supposed to uh, and cannot be attacked uh, through these um, other types of memory attacks with the translations. All right, and uh, for Zen3, we also added uh, a bunch of um, instruction set uh, enhancements uh, for encryption, decryption. We increased a couple instructions, AES and uh, MOLE QDQ. Uh, from 128 bit to 256 bit. Uh, we added uh, memory protection keys for users features so that users can change the, the read write access behavior uh, just by changing a key without having to change all the individual page tables. Again, with the emphasis on security, uh, we added a shadow stack feature that helps protect against return oriented programming attacks. You know, calls and returns are tracked with a shadow stack and they must be perfectly matched. Otherwise, you know, it generates a security exception. Uh, we talked about uh, these other SEVS and secure nested paging. Uh, we created a new instruction uh, in validate page broadcast. Uh, you know, in, in previous uh, systems, x86 systems, you know, uh, actual interrupts are sent uh, throughout the fabric to do TLB invalidations. This simplifies it by sending those invalidations uh, directly. Uh, you can think of them like probes, and therefore there's no interrupt handler that has to run uh, the cores, talk directly to each other, and achieve the uh, TLB invalidation. So it's a lot more efficient. And finally, we added a, a process context ID uh, so that uh, different processes translations I can say resident as you as you cycle through uh, different processes as our TLBs are getting quite large um, and time between processes uh, can can be low. We can uh, accelerate those types of workloads as well. All right, uh, on the on the microarchitecture side for Zen three, our objectives uh, starting were of course to deliver another landmark increase in one T performance through IPC and frequency and you know, hitting our power budget. Um, you know, again, like I said, it was a, a ground up core uh, that was you know, rethinking everything in it. Uh, we wanted to get a, a bigger cash sharing domain um, so that there are less you know, transfers back and forth uh, outside of uh, the cache between the caches. I want to still maintain a good tight latency within the, the uh, complex. And provide you know scale out performance uh, for servers, data centers, and supercomputers being able to uh, you know put out a lot of these uh, eight core complexes to provide a large uh, systems. You know we introduced the new obviously we continually move the needle always on ISA to improve uh, you know workloads and key instructions. Uh, we're always you know kind of moving the bar forward on security features to make process are more and more secure and uh, come out uh, with this new, new uh, 3D vCache integration for workloads that really can benefit from even a larger L3, be able to provide that to the market while still providing a, a good baseline core as well for those who don't who can't leverage that uh, extra L3. And at the platform level, you know, we're doing we're support for scaling and energy efficiency and maintaining our socket compatibility with uh, the previous generation. So you don't have to pr provide any new uh, boards or infrastructure. All right, so here, uh, uh, here's a, I'm gonna go through an overview of the Zen3 architecture. We're gonna deep dive on all these blocks. Um, so don't worry if you miss something here at the high level, we'll get back to it. Uh, but we tend to start up in the right corner uh, with our branch predictor. 
you know, it's a state-of-the-art branch predictor, feeding, uh, uh, you know, targets to go fetch. On the left way, we have two ways into the machine, a traditional 32K eight-way iCache, feeding a traditional x86 decoder at four instructions per cycle. However, if we've seen the instructions before, one of the critical paths uh, for x86 is it's a variable length instruction set. And so trying to find, you know, multiple uh, instructions quickly, uh, you know, is a, is, a, is a speed path in the architecture. And so if we've seen them before, uh, we store them in an op cache, uh, since we already know their lengths, and we store them much wider at eight, what we should call macro ops per cycle. Our, we, our macro ops are very, uh, have a lot of information in them. So they typically map one-to-one -to, -one to an x86 instruction. So you can think of it as we're getting eight instructions uh, in the op cache, doubling uh, the throughput. We also, from the op cache, since not only have we done the lengthy code, but we've, we've learned other things about the instructions. We cut two stages off the pipeline uh, so we can deliver them faster in the op queue and save a lot of power uh, as well. So it's one of our best features um, with the power savings and the performance uplift. But we use the op queue to decouple which side uh, of the machine, the front end you came from, to feed into the dispatch uh, the instructions. Now we use what we call the traditional coprocessor model that is kind of built into the ISA, meaning we have separate schedulers, separate register files, separate uh, execution pipes for the integer versus the floating point. On the integer side, we have you know, four uh, ALUs. Uh, however, we have created for Xan3 dedicated branch and store data units. So now those used to be shared. You have more throughput for those. And you also have more throughput for the ALUs because they're not doing these other activities as well as the base compute. But we can also uh, do three address generations per cycle. Uh, on the floating point side, we have, we're capable of doing two 256-bit FP uh, uh, multiply accumulates per cycle in those mole pipes, as well as we have uh, two add pipes uh, uh, for general uh, traditional uh, floating point compute. And uh, we'll talk, but we have uh, also widened out with uh, a separate store pipe and uh, floating point to integer. There's a lot of, uh, because of the separate register files, there can be a lot of movement of register data back and forth between the integer and the floating point register file. And so we have optimizations to make that quickly. We can process you know, three memory ops per cycle in the load store unit. Uh, our TLBs uh, at the L1 level, we have 64 entries on both the instruction and data side. They can hold all page sizes. And then at the L2 TLB on the I side, we have 512 entries. On the D side, we have uh, 2K entries. Uh, we can hold all page sizes except one gig. We can only hold one gig pages since they're so large. And our L1 with uh, 64 entries. All right, so now let's uh, let's deep dive into the blocks. Um, you know, for our uh, branch predictor, uh, well, key was we wanted to uh, you know. Uh, lower the, uh, get more bandwidth out of the branch predictor, but also as always, when we're wrong, uh, we wanna lower the misprediction of getting the target address back. We were able to do that over uh, our previous generation. And one of the other critical um, speed paths in a branch predictor is, you know, when you look it up and you get the, uh, the next target address out, to turn that around back in and, and uh, is usually inserts a bubble before you can get that target address to get the next address. Uh, we've come up with some unique technology to avoid that bubble and to be able to get uh, a taken branch prediction every cycle out of the branch predictor. Uh, it is a, uh, we improved, uh, it was a page on, on, on Zen 2, but we've improved it for Zen 3. Uh, we redistributed what we call our BTB or branch target buffers uh, for better latency. Uh, the L1 uh, has 1,024 uh, entries, and the L2 is at 6.5K now. And in x86, there are, you know, indirect branches that, um, you know, you don't, uh, uh, can have variable targets. And so if they have, if they only have one target, even though they could be variable, they just stay in the natural uh, branch target buffers. But if we see multiple targets, we have a special 
indirect target array that tracks uh, the different targets and builds prediction logic specifically for them to try to predict which target it's going to be this time. Um, yeah, we have a eight-way 32K iCache. Uh, we've improved the throughput in it of it. We've improved its uh, prefetching into it. Uh, we streamlined our opcache, uh, building faster sequencing to get it uh, uh, to get uh, those eight macro ops out. As well as it's always, you know, a, a pain point in the architecture of when you're switching back and forth between the iCache and Opcache. We did a much better job in this generation of being able to sync those two things up as you're getting maybe a mixed view uh, through there. Um, uh, and then we then we move on into uh, dispatch. So. To add dispatch, we can send six macro ops per cycle into the execution. Um, we have a new distributed scheduler organization, improving the latencies for some instructions. You know, as you can see, so we've gone from used to be able to issue seven uh, instructions now with the extra, uh, you can see them on here, the extra branch units uh, and uh, stored data. We can issue 10 integer instructions per cycle, seven before. With that, we bumped up the register file. Uh, the scheduler's a little bit bigger and reorder buffer, which is um, how many instructions we can have in flight uh, in the machine at a time, uh, we bumped up from 224 to 256. So, you know, basically, you know, lower latencies, larger structures to get, find more ILP, get more throughput, more dedicated, uh, units so that we can use the ALUs for what they need to do for compute, while things like uh, you know stores and branches can be uh, have their own dedicated units as well uh, for getting their work done. Yeah, so uh, uh, just to deep dive on those integer execution units a little bit, uh, you know, by doing this we have a lot more what we call pick bandwidth for the different operations uh, since they have now unique uh, pickers, schedulers for those uh, unique units. You can see Zen uh, 2 on the top and Zen 3. We've added those uh, branch capabilities and the store capabilities. Um, in doing so, you know, since branches and stores don't write back into the base um, a register file, uh, we didn't have to add any write ports or bypass networks. So, and, and building up, you know, uh, a high performance computer, those are, those are some of the pinch points um, of complexity. And, you know, we share, we have some shared ALU, HGU schedulers to allow for balanced use across workloads. And, you know, definitely it's bringing, you know, more throughput uh, out of the machine uh, while not added, increasing the power. And again, that's, that's why we have to kind of open up the full design take a fresh look and do uh, significant changes like this to be able to add that throughput, that IPC without uh, uh, power impact. Similar on the floating point side, uh, we used to be able to only dispatch four floating point ops per cycle. Uh, we would increase that to six. Uh, we uh, increased or decreased the latency of our floating point multiply accumulate from five cycles to four. Uh, significantly grown the FP scheduler uh, from 36 entries to 64 entries. Uh, and similar to the, uh, oh yeah, we doubled the uh, uh, integer eight throughput uh, for inference workload. So there's two pipes of that now uh, in Zen 3. And similar to, to the integer side, we, you know, we added a dedicated floating point to integer pipe, as well as a combined store and floating point to integer pipe so that the base multiplies and at floating point adds and, and uh, ALU work uh, have, you know, don't get bogged down dealing with uh, other activities and we have the full throughput uh, of the machine uh, to dedicate. Um, yeah, now the load store queue. Um, we grew the store queue to 64 from 48. Uh, you know, we improved our prefetch, prefetching capability. Uh, we also added um, an MSR interface to be able to control 
uh, our prefetchers a little bit better and enlarge footprints, workloads on the large amount of words we're putting into the system. Um, having some control of the prefetchers at the uh, uh, you know the software level can can be helpful. We really grew the throughput of the, the load store unit, three loads per cycle uh, and two stores per cycle. It can only be a max of three memory ops, but it can be in that. It used to be a two and one. Uh, no 2 TLB is the same, but we actually grew to six uh, table walkers. Um, so for those workloads that are doing a lot of sparse accesses, uh, large uh, you know, data footprints, uh, we can get those table walks going and overlap and, and really improve uh, those type of workloads. How we improve some of our, uh, our short strings so that our, our mem copies, uh, when they're dealing with small uh, data sets, can move a lot faster. And we, as, as we always do, generationally, we uh, built up our ability to predict store load dependencies. Therefore, you know, we can uh, basically treat that load as a, a zero cycle load, pick up the store data and move on. All right, so to, uh, uh, to summarize again, the major changes of Zen 3 versus Zen 2. And you can look at, you know, again, at the block diagram level, you know, they may not look that different, but I think as you heard, as we went through each of the blocks, just major differences I, you know, grounds up redesign in, in Zen 3. So uh, on the front end, you know, that L1 BTB that was 1K, that's twice as large as it was uh, before. You know, we have the no bubble branch prediction and improved branch predictor bandwidth, getting more branch targets out faster. Shorter pipeline for our redirect when we are wrong. And just our ability to mix and match uh, uh, instructions at Hopcache, and you know, we're all about trying to feed. The front end has to feed this very wide throughput uh, machine we're giving, so we get you know the full benefit of adding all the extra throughput in the execution units. Where, again, we added dedicated branch and store data pickers. Uh, we added uh, you know the, the larger reorder buffer, added 32 instructions more that can be in flight, uh, reduced some key instructions latencies. FP grew its dispatch width and faster uh, floating point multiply accumulate down to four cycles. And then on the load store unit, you know, we have more load and store bandwidth, uh, more flexibility of which ops can, can go at the same time. We can do three loads per cycle. And you know, growing those uh, the table walkers, we used to only have two, now we have six, so we can really deal with those sparse uh, memory access workloads. All right, so now boiling it all that architectural work, you know, how did uh, you know how did it affect the baseline? We obviously said, you know, it's a 19% IPC uplift, but and, and this is it's not an exact science to attribute these features to this percentage to one feature or another. They do, they are very complementary uh, a lot of the time. But as you can see, you know, I focus a lot on those front end changes. The front end improvements uh, were a big component. Also with uh, you know the load store unit you know x86 being a load store architecture those being able to do more loads be able to feed the machine or key, um, but as you can see across the board we did change everything and it really was necessary to change everything to be able to get them to work together to deliver this amazing 19% IPC uplift. And of course you know that's obviously a, a geo mean. Um, obviously, you know, different workloads react differently to the, the, the places in the, in the architecture we're improving. Uh, or, uh, you know, a lot of the lower ones are already at typically a pretty high IPC level. So improving them that much is much harder than other workloads that are at a lower IPC level. There's obviously more room for improvement. But as you can see, this a lot swath of workloads, uh, you know, a lot of games, um, some micro benchmarks, um, just across the board, just, just you know, a lot of improvement uh, uh, over our previous uh, generation. 
And then we don't just deliver cores. Obviously, we have to deliver uh, an SOC where there were also uh, big changes. You know, we used to have the two four core 60 meg L3 caches on the same die. And it actually, uh, they needed to get to the other, the data out of the other cache on the same die. They'd actually have to go out in the fabric to realize it was there. So by pulling you know, all eight cores in the die, uh, together with the 32 meg L3 cache, we get a lot more sharing, uh, you know, reduce uh, memory latency, accelerate uh, the cache to cache transfers since we have more places for it to come from, uh, you know, and still maintain a low latency, uh, even though it does go up as you're sharing a cache across more cores. Uh, right. Yeah, with that, you know, uh, we have a new green bus to be able to uh, communicate the data uh, to all the different cores, uh, you know, high bandwidth, low latency, and uh, move 32 bytes a cycle in either direction in this bi-directional ring bus. Now looking at it from uh, this perspective, and, you know, we've talked a lot about the core complex. CCD is uh, core complex die. Um, the, uh, you know, we traditionally, you can see uh, here, we're still moving 32 bytes a cycle uh, everywhere through from high cache to L2 uh, to the L3. Uh, we have the fast private 512K L2 cache, uh, eight-way set associative. Uh, the L3 is still a victim cache. Uh, it's mostly exclusive. It's filled with uh, victims. And so what we do have we have what we call duplicate tags. So if, for example, it, it misses in core zero, this is a victim cache and misses in the L3, uh, but it will realize that the shadow tags will say, hey, it's in core seven. You don't need to go out into the uh, fabric. We know that, you know, go, we'll route the request over into core seven, pull the data out quickly and uh, install the data in core zero. So we can find all the data within the complex and transfer it uh, very quickly. From each L2 to L3, there can be 64 outstanding misses. And then one, if there's a miss in the L3 from any of the cores, we have 192 uh, buffers to hold all those misses. And on top of that, um, we have the uh, AMD 3D Bcache where we can actually grow uh, the size uh, of the L3. So, uh, um, you know, that base design includes the original 32 meg L3 cache, but then we can add 96 megs of it with a 64 meg of AMD 3D V cache. Uh, we enable that through silicon vias on the CCD for it to talk, uh, I'll talk to that new cache with a direct uh, copper to copper bond. So very small increase in latency, uh, but a large, a lot more capacity, obviously a lot more reduction in memory latency and still being able to transfer all that 96 between uh, the eight cores. Uh, so uh, we still get that great uh, sharing uh, within the complex. And just some uh, data, you know, uh, here again, on um, workloads that can really leverage this uh, up to 15% faster uh, gaming performance uh, when using the 3DB cache. So, uh, it's a great technology uh, that the team uh, is bringing to bear uh, in our new Zen 3. Yeah, so uh, uh, that concludes my talk. I mean, I hope uh, learned a lot about uh, core architecture, uh, you know, things uh, in the industry, how we have properties to deliver it, and, you know, how we continue to drive high performance computing, AMD does, into the future. Thank you, Michael, for yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for the great talk. I really appreciate. It. So we have uh, lots of questions in the in Q and A. Uh, so I'm going to read out some of the question and then uh, allow people to ask live if they want. Uh, so first question is, uh, how do you foresee processor architecture changing in coming years, seeing more structured workloads like machine learning becoming more popular day by day? 
Yeah, um, you know, we continue to uh, evolve, uh, you know, the features inside the core. Uh, like with Zen 3, you know, we doubled the integer eight support uh, for uh, inference. Um, we continue to, you know, we see inference being done mostly on CPU today. So we will continue to look at, you know, ICE extensions as well as just more hardware throughput uh, as the workloads grow. Of course we do. Um, also, uh, we're, as a company, uh, produce GPUs. So we do have also our, our GPU team uh, and the Instinct line also attacking uh, AI and machine learning where, you know, the traditional, uh, the traditional workloads in a CPU uh, that need to run well for the smaller data types. Uh, you know, once uh, the data are not built for, um, you know, some of the larger uh, size of uh, workloads where a GPU can be more efficient. And so for those, we, we you know, encourage offloading to the GPU uh, to keep our CPU performance uh, nice and tight and low latency. Thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, are the SCV ISA extensions and more generally the security extensions AMD only or does Intel also support them? If not, why? And do you see a convergence in the near future or only in the long term? Yeah, they, uh, they currently are today AMD only. I mean, it's not, uh, but not that Intel couldn't use them or uh, do something similar. I think historically, um, we have done different uh, hypervisor. Uh, we're different in, in our hypervisor. That's been true since the original introduction. Um, because of that, that has you know, led to more uh, by x86 in that environment. But um, I believe Intel is is pursuing similar technology, and there's not but there's nothing that prevents them um, from doing similar uh, similar uh, architectural uh, mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, requested asked live. So. We will promote it to the panelists and you can unmute yourself to ask Wang Xiaoyu. Well, it may take a little bit of time. So I'm gonna go ahead for the, the next question while uh, we're uh, setting up for the uh, live question. So I'm gonna ask the next question. Uh, does your uh, L2C prefetcher cross physical page boundaries? Um, yes. I mean, we definitely uh, can cross uh, 4K page boundaries, especially in a two meg page. Um, I mean, we won't uh, prefetch physically anything that this process, you know, doesn't have a valid uh, TLB entry for it. I would, uh, we consider that a security violation, but yes, we, we can prefetch past page boundaries where we know there's a valid translation there. Thank you. So next question, ask live. Okay, uh, thanks, thank you, Mac, for the uh, great talk. Uh, I am a CPU uh, engineer from the uh, small CPU company, and I would like to know what's the purpose of split the, the integer as well and, uh, uh, and the floating pointer as well. So is it for some power saving, like uh, the floating point a unit can be getting off when there is no workload? You broke up a little bit there on the key, uh, the key word. Um, what feature? Uh, to split the, the, the integer as well oh. with the the, the floating point very well. Is that for power saving purpose or? Uh, no, um, it's really just, uh, I would say, the complexity of building, uh, really in, architecturally, the registers are completely different. 
And so the register files want to be different anyway. This is a, a floating point. Registers are much larger. There's not a real benefit to sharing the register file. And then from a scheduler perspective, you know, a lot of operations on the integer side are single cycle. And even and ones that aren't, uh, we tend to not support across all the ALU pipelines. And uh, you know, as as an architect, you know, as you get more complicated latencies for instructions, that complicates the scheduler. So based on just kind of the, the complexity and physical layout, we've chosen an AMD here to do a what we call a coprocessor style physical implementation. You can you can obviously others do you know have a unified scheduler for integer and floating point. Uh, we feel it also does have performance benefits when you're mixing integer and floating point code. Uh, you you can get the full uh, you know issue uh, width of uh, you know, the distributed schedulers and be working on the integer components and the floating point components in parallel without having them you know fight for uh, scheduling bandwidth. Okay, okay. that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next question is, uh, what's your thoughts are on how the shortage in the semiconductor industry is affecting or will affect AMD's roadmap? Um, I mean, those are definitely business challenges. Um, I think uh, uh, we've been able to uh, meet them so far and hopefully going forward, <laughs> they'll continue to get better. I think uh, I think it's you know obviously been good for us for our business, but also you know the the reinvigoration of, of people um, you know using computers at home, not only because uh, and you know realizing you know they need a desktop computer with more horsepower, you know all the uh, obviously conferences like this, all the emphasis on uh, video technology. And being able to video conference, uh, I think is all great, right? It, it's really accelerated uh, a process that's been slowly moving and it's gonna make us all more productive. I mean, still, you know, I, I do look forward uh, to when we all get back into the office because uh, as engineers <laughs> myself, um, uh, you know, whatever historically we're not that great at communicators and uh, it really helps especially in uh, these type of at least for us uh, you know designing cores to kind of have that be able to get in a room and easily whiteboard and and or easily hear somebody talking about a problem across the hall and, and just getting up and going and, and helping them solve it because they're missing some just like the human interaction component in our job um yeah i, I feel is is so important and, and looking forward to getting back i do think there we may have lost something we'll have to see of you know uh you know short-term loss of for our, our upcoming projects that weren't able to have all that uh engineering connectivity in their design Thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, what future do you envision for the SMT support in server CPUs? For example, uh, ARM, uh, Newverse, or AWS, Graviton, two CPUs designers advocate for uh, dropping the SMT completely? <laughs> so um, I would say, obviously, you know, uh, SMT can provide some interesting uh, security issues, although I think we're kind of over that as far as realizing uh, within the hypervisor and, and the OS that we should only be scheduling, you know, uh, not only for security, but for performance, scheduling, you know, uh, these CPUs or processes from the same security domain on both threads. So, uh, now that software is, is accomplishing that, I mean, SMT is one of our uh, best per watt features uh, that we have. I mean, for, you know, a traditional 
small amount of area, uh, we can get huge uplift. There's no feature that provides a purple one advantage uh, like SMT. And so we continue to, uh, uh, we're going to continue to provide it. Um, obviously, there's, you know, in the world of workloads, there are lots of places that, uh, you know, SMT doesn't work well in the sense that if uh, you're already bandwidth limited, going in another thread doesn't help. Uh, you know, if you have, if you have to pay software costs per thread, obviously having a, a stronger core threads works. But the, but the majority of the market, um, you know, SMT is a huge benefit from a, a per, per watt, and we will continue to uh, provide it. Thank you. Uh, if you want to ask question, please ask in Q and A instead of chat. Uh, so next question is, uh, we see a great performance improvement over the years from, uh, so uh, could you comment on what the change of the technology note from 2018 to 2019? Um, from, uh, sorry, from 14 nanometer to seven nanometer, is that the particular change? I guess that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was a particularly good change in that we, uh, um, hopefully I'm understanding your question. I, I apologize if I'm not, but yeah, that was a, we actually skipped two nodes. There was a 10 nanometer node. So that really gave us the leverage to be able to grow that uh, L3 cache per core from two meg to four meg and to be able to, uh, you know, in a derivative design, uh, do a lot of bigger changes to be able to deliver that 15% uh, IPC we we accomplished uh, with Zen 2. So, you know, I mean, as a good architect, that's uh, that's your job. Every, you know, every generation you're going to get more transistors. It's your job to make them, you know, to use every transistor wisely and effectively um, as they are getting out. Uh, we are transitioning slower and they are getting more expensive. So, um, you know, that's the good architects um, utilize all their transistors. Okay. Next question. How do you see the past five to 10 years of microarchitecture research papers and conferences effect on uh, microprocessor design from your viewpoint? For instance, is there any set of papers that change the way of your thinking in processor design? I, yeah, I mean, definitely the research, love the research, love what's going on. You know, I'm sure, you know, we have lots of young guys coming on the team. Um, we have lots of guys who, who obviously look at uh, research and learning, and uh, we definitely need that to continue. Um, we, uh, but I, I mean, I would say I've been told several times in my career that, you know, microarchitectures, uh, you know, running out of gas, we, you know, I'm told we, we just built the perfect architecture. You can't do any better. You should find another problem to look at. And I don't believe it. I mean, there is so much more uh, we can do to, uh, you know, improve the performance of workloads and the hardware and so much innovation going on and it's going to continue. So uh, if, if anybody ever tells you that, you know, don't believe them. <laughs> there's, there's miles and miles to go. Thank you. Uh, we have less time left. So I'm gonna let the pe people who uh, line up for Ask Live to go ahead. So Georgios, please go ahead to ask your question. Unmute yourself. Hello. Um, I'm Georgios Vavuliotis from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the great presentation. So actually, this is a follow-up question about L2 cusp prefetching beyond page boundaries. And actually, the question is, since L2 cusp prefetchers operate on the physical address space, how do they know that, they, that it's allowed it to go through beyond four kilobyte boundaries? Do you propagate somehow the page size information or do you check directly the TLB when you want to create cross page boundaries and you do a reverse, a reverse translation mapping? Thank you. I appreciate, you know, the question and the, uh, uh, the inquisitiveness, but 
you know, that's something I can't really comment on how uh, it's kind of proprietary, how we uh, get that done. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have <laughs> we have one minute left. Uh, last question, I guess. Uh, can you tell us anything about the layout or uh, replacement policy of the operation cash in Zen three? Um, I mean, it is. I can tell you that you know each uh, it is address sliced, um, and so the you know the data isn't stored in any way local to who may have last requested it. You know, for the eight cores. You know, there's address bits that, that take you to, there's eight slices in the L3, there's address bits that take you there. Obviously, it is a big L3, and so um, you know, based on where the data actually is, it is a variable latency L3, but the delta between the closest and furthest is, is you know, a, a minimal number of cycles. And so um, uh, I, I think that's, I think we've disclosed that. That's about all I can uh, disclose. Thank you. Uh, I think it's time for the for keynote. And thank you again for Michael for the great talk. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. I wish I could be there in person. Um, but that's, you know, it is what it is. Thank you. Just a second, uh, Mike, if you can stop sharing. Oh, yep. Sorry. We we will certainly mail it to you, but you know it's it's just a certificate of our appreciation for giving the the keynote. We will be we will be mailing anti mailing this to you afterwards. Okay, thanks. I definitely enjoyed the talk and the questions and the interaction. It's all all fun for me. I'm a core architect. I love this stuff. Like if you do have the opportunity and the time. Uh, the next half an hour or oh, 15 minutes is a break. Uh, and there are questions that folks might have. Uh, if you can hop on to Gather Town, um, if you have the time, uh, folks can try to do hallway conversations with you. <laughs> okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to find Gather Town. Is, that, uh, is there a link somewhere or is that obvious? It should be. We'll send it's it to you. Hoover, it's in the Hoover agenda. It's right after this, uh, the link, the link that you use to join. It's, it's the next one. You, you find the break and you can join the other time. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So we have this 15 minutes break now, and then we continue with the, um, the best paper session. <laughs>